Hello my fellow lifeforms, and welcome to Phantom Universe. We're just going to be taking a look at the surface of the Earth today. This is going to be a very different video than what you guys are used to. The previous videos have been very complex. The way I construct them and write them out, it's very... It takes a while, let's just put it that way. And recently it's been rather difficult to get the time to actually sit down and make a new one. I have, however, have been working on a script for the next themed video to come out. But for today, I just wanted to come on here to Google Earth and just show you guys some of the features that I can specifically point out to you that I would argue to be very substantial information that I think most of us need to know about. And apologies in advance because I'm currently in the basement. That's where I have my computer set up and you will be hearing basement noises every now and then. So apologies in advance for that, but here we go. We're going to take a look at the United States today, specifically over here in the East Coast. If you zoom into this Carolina area, there are some very interesting features that we find scattering throughout the entirety of the East Coast. We find these very pronounced elliptical depressions into the ground. Using LiDAR technology, it is clear that there are thousands more that we cannot see. And heavy erosion over thousands of years probably erased many more of them. And some of them are extremely big. Like, let's take a look at this one. This one specifically is two and a half miles. This is an extremely large feature on the ground. I mean, just take a look over here. We have like a building over here to give you kind of a sense of scale. We had no idea these things even existed until we had the ability to fly. Because if you're just standing on the ground, that just looks like an open field to you and then you just kind of have this ring. There was probably some people who noticed these things, but they had no idea what they were, so they probably just ignored them. After we discovered them, people began digging into them looking for extraterrestrial rock, but would always come up empty handed. So it's always been a question as to what the heck formed these things for the longest time. Many hypotheses suggest that it was wind and water erosion. The wind would blow across these lakes, causing the earth to be pressed outward. Hypotheses of giant beavers doing this during the ice age. Lots of interesting stuff. So because there are these massive oval shapes and we can like figure out where their peaks are, and figure out where they're all like pointing to, we find that they all converge up here in the Great Lakes, specifically where Saginaw Crater is located in Michigan. Including the Coriolis effect, all of these depressions all converge into this one spot. Saginaw Crater itself is rather substantial. There's a lot of different dates that they give for how old this crater could actually be, and some of them go as far back as 786,000 years old. But that's just one of those things that we don't really know. However, there are some other hypotheses that could put this at a much younger date. If this object had hit us during the Ice Age, there was a massive glacier sitting right here on top of Michigan, and the impact would have ejected trillions of tons of ice into the atmosphere. We're talking objects the size of cars to houses to baseball stadiums getting launched into the sky in all directions at two miles per second. All of that material would eventually fall back down to the planet, pelting the ground so violently the scars can still be seen today. So these have the potential of being craters, created by the largest hailstorm this planet has probably ever seen. Which would explain why they're all pointing to the same spot and why we find no material at the bottom of them because it was ice. It just melted away. Only a few years ago, they discovered a giant crater sitting under the glacier in Greenland. The rim just now starting to poke out of the glacier sitting on top of it. This crater could possibly date to 13,000 years ago, which is relatively recent in the geological sense of time on the planet. Humans were around 13,000 years ago. Humans back then were supposedly super primitive, using stone and bone and wood for their tools. Very primitive kind of stuff. But they would have most definitely experienced this event. During the peak of the last ice age, 15,000 years ago, there was a giant glacier sitting on top of Canada and a decent portion of the northern United States. And you can clearly see around 13,000 years ago, the Earth's climate jumped extremely high in temperature and then rapidly shot back down again. If this object was able to cause such a massive heat spike over top of the glacier it just hit, the amount of ice that would instantly liquefy when this thing hit the planet would be substantial. Ocean water currents have an extreme importance to the temperature and state of our planet. If anything in this system of energy gets disrupted, 
a lot of crazy stuff could happen to the planet. The moment this object hit the ground, it would explode with such a level of energy we cannot comprehend the devastation it could cause. The vaporized and ejected material would slowly wrap around the planet and block out the sun. And also keep in mind, all this ice melted, so the whole system gets interrupted. This could absolutely cause the temperatures to then drop back down into freezing. This center transition right here, once it's at the bottom of that deep freeze, is called the Younger Darius. It's another thousand years of bitter glacial freezing gripping the planet, and then around 12,000 years ago, we get hit by something again. There's many hypotheses to explain how we came back out of it. There is speculation that it could have been a solar flare that hit us, causing a sudden rise in temperature. But another hypothesis is that it was another impact event somewhere into possibly the Pacific Ocean. If an object did hit the ocean, the amount of water that would instantly vaporize into the atmosphere would be substantial. This blanket of mystified water would then completely engulf the planet and rain back down to the surface for days to weeks to months on end. The whole climate after such a rain out would be extremely humid and would just then bake in the sun. But that doesn't completely shove out the solar flare hypothesis. If a comet came that close to the planet, it very well could have also come just as close to the sun. And there are studies that would suggest that when a comet or any large object hits the sun, it can cause a massive ejection of material. Robert Schock has a very interesting idea. Throughout many ancient cultures all around the planet, there are very common figures in their pictograms. Robert Schock has an idea that when a solar flare of that kind of magnitude hits the planet, the light entering the atmosphere would cause a very strange shape to be seen. And this is some of the shapes that he suggests we would find, which are also very similar to these shapes we see in ancient cultures. Very interesting idea. But after this entire catastrophe finally calmed down, all of the glacial ice that was sitting on top of the planet during the Ice Age melted rapidly. From the geological studies they've been doing in Washington State, studies that have been done in the past decade suggest that massive quantities of water tore across this landscape in recent history. Most of it is all dried up land at this point, and we just have the faint traces still trickling through them. But one interesting thing right over here, this land formation is called Dry Falls. Imagine an 800 to 1,000 foot wave, several miles across, tearing across the landscape at 60 to possibly even 100 miles an hour. The bedrock underneath it is just sand to that quantity of water. The material flowing down becomes abrasive and it tears at the earth and that's what this formation is. This formation is one mile across. And to give you a sense of scale, Niagara Falls, which is massive, if, if you've never been there, it's a great place to go to, is 1,000 1037 feet across and this is not even the full width of this river you can see where it was all flowing through here as well cataclysmic what I would call world destroying floods tore across the planet J Harlan Bretz was an independent geologist who was studying these formations back in 1920 he was a very controversial subject back then Bretz was one of the first people to really get a detailed survey of the formations we found here in Washington and suggested that massive cataclysmic floods tore across the landscape. Academia back then was really trying to avoid any type of biblical flood story, so any suggestion that a massive flood tore across the planet at some point was basically scientific heresy. People back in the 1920s had a very different perspective of how these land formations formed on the planet. They had an extreme version of uniformitarianism, the theory that changes in the Earth's crust during geological history have resulted from the actions of continuous and uniform processes. So they took that idea and they said that these formations took millions upon millions of years to slowly form from stuff like we see here at Niagara Falls. But new ideas and hypotheses are being put forward to suggest that these formations were formed in a matter of weeks to months. All of the water melting from the ice would tear down the landscape where it would eventually enter into the oceans, raising ocean levels globally 400 feet to where they are now in our modern day. The oceans got a massive pulse in levels 15 and around 11 to 12,000 years ago, which would also absolutely line up with when the comet first hit us, and then the second event when they melted for the last and final time. 
You can clearly see where the coastlines used to be. Massive quantities of Earth that have ended up underwater for thousands of years. Humans would have absolutely been living on coastlines just like we do today. We have only searched 8% of the oceans of the planet so far. So who knows what could be lying under endless miles of water. This event would be remembered by our species. They would pass down the story of the world ending flood for as long as they possibly could. These ancient stories record the history of our species on this planet, specific events that they have been trying to remember since they happened. And the biblical flood is only one of them.